Thanks, Peter. Right. Um, Australia did have a navy in the First World War. I wrote a book about it recently. What it did was highlight to me how little we know about what the Navy did, what its achievements were, uh, and how, even how it, the experience affected our post-war planning. For a maritime nation, albeit one with a continental outlook, this isn't a good foundation for progress. Now, over the next few minutes, I intend to briefly cover three key areas uh, that I believe need further research, certainly areas that deserve far longer uh, attention than I could give to them. I'm not planning to do these, uh, or do this work, but I'll be more than happy to po uh, point anyone here in the right direction. Um, I'll then provide some preliminary thoughts on my own next major project, after the official history. <laughs> the Royal Navy's much misunderstood battlecruiser fleet, with particular focus on the second battlecruiser squadron, which incorporated a significant Antipodean element. So first, let's have a look at maritime operations beyond the North Sea. You're probably all aware of the maritime blockade of the Central Powers, a book entitled How the Navy Won the War, The Real Instrument of Victory 1914-1918 is about to be published in the United Kingdom. I'm fairly certain it will use the North Sea blockade as a central example. What it is not likely to do is to cover the similar measures carried out elsewhere in the world, in particular off East Africa, the uh, West Atlantic off the east coast of the Americas, and even in Southeast Asia. All these theatres had a significant Australian naval presence, and all possessed their own unique complexity. Two in particular are worthy of note, particularly in the context of the US-Australian relationship before 1917. This year, our embassy in the US commemorates 100 years of mateship, focusing on the Battle of Hamel. But off the US East Coast and the Philippines, we have numerous, numerous examples of friction between a belligerent and a neutral nation. Wartime diaries in the archives in Kew and in Washington are full of incidents of deliberate penetration by Australian warships into American territorial waters, alleged harassment of US citizens, and diplomatic protests at the highest levels. How much of it got back to Australia, I can't tell you but there is certainly a great paper to be written on the attitude of Australian sailors to their American counterparts. Demonstrating our own unique national independence had a lot to do with it, and I might suggest a title like The Young Glory versus The Old Glory, <laughs> which was the nicknames given to our two national flags. Secondly, and speaking of human relationships, there's also far more to discover about what I might term, with tongue firmly in cheek, the last forgotten Anzacs, or hidden, or whatever else you want to call them. These were the men from India, Africa, and China, and potentially from Aboriginal backgrounds, who manned Australian ships operating in tropical waters. They often performed the more manually intensive tasks that in non-air conditioned ships, European sailors found too difficult to handle. This includes people like stewards, cooks, coal trimmers, and what the Navy termed sun-exposed working parties. At times, due to, due to a lack of personnel, due to illness or postings, it was only through these men that our ships were kept operating. I managed to find documentary details for just one East African sailor during my own search, um, and only a single photograph that might show our Aboriginal sailors. Further research, particularly in British records, should identify many more of these men and at least bring greater recognition to their role. Thirdly, there are the advances in naval technology and tactics in areas such as anti-submarine warfare, anti-air warfare and ship-based aviation. These were cutting edge capabilities that the RAN had to reduce, uh, introduce from scratch, but thereafter became <coughs> fundamental to naval warfare. What sorts of new equipment do you need? How much is enough? What training regimes do you need to introduce? What tactics do you, do you employ? These are all vital questions. Now, some work has been done on our Australian naval aviation capabilities, and I've done a bit of work on anti-submarine warfare. But anti-air warfare seems to have been completely neglected. Why, for example, and we see the picture here, were HMAS Australia's anti-aircraft guns positioned facing astern. Was it because that's the only spot that was available? 
Well, was it because that's what the tactics dictated <coughs> about where the Germans were likely to attack? I don't know, but I'm sure the answer's out there somewhere. And by the way, there's two anti-aircraft guns there, one on the, uh, the platform just on the after super structure. Um, well, I, you know, and there's lots of little interesting things about this. For those of you who have, who have read my book, you might be aware that most of the rounds fired by the Australian Navy in World War I weren't, weren't fired during the engagement with Emden. They were actually fired by HMAS Sydney when it was involved in the defence of London from the Gotha raids in 1917. So let's look now at the battlecruiser fleet. So much has been written about Jutland, perhaps Jutland blindness, if to, to follow another presentation, uh, but it's usually without context. <laughs> and I'd argue that the Royal Navy's battlecruiser fleet is very much misunderstood. The first thing to appreciate is that it wasn't just made up of battlecruisers. By 1918, the battlecruiser fleet also had on its strength submarines, destroyers, cruisers and aircraft carriers and managed to carry out a succession of extremely complex, multi-dimensional operations, including the electromagnetic spectrum, across the North Sea involving upwards of 100 units. A testbed for innovation, many of the techniques and procedures that afterwards became routine seem to have originated in the battlecruiser fleet. Refuelling at sea is one example, and it was an Australian ship, although taken over by the Brits, that was actually involved in some of this, these early trials with refuelling at sea. But aviation is another where much remains to be uncovered, which I'm sure that um, Ashley will get into. The problem here is that when the Royal Naval Air Service, as James has uh, um, changed to the RAF in 1918, the records went to the Air Ministry, which, as James said, means that when, if you want to look at the RNAS, you tend to read the official history of the air. I am not aware of anyone in the last few years who has looked at the Air Department records, or the Air records in queue, to find out the RNAS story. The tendency was always to go to the Admiralty records. So I'm sure there's lots more there to be found. So why the focus on the second battlecruiser squadron? Well, to start with, its flagship was HMAS Australia, and the light cruisers Sydney and Melbourne were also part of the force. So a significant proportion of the tonnage was actually Australian. Moreover, one of the other two battlecruisers in the squadron was Australia's sister ship, HMS New Zealand, which although technically a British ship, was paid for by the New Zealand taxpayer, had a fair proportion of Kiwi officers and men, and the New Zealand public certainly regarded it as, as our ship. None of the other capital ships named after British territories, and I'm thinking there of uh, capital ships in the way of uh, Malaya or Canada, had nearly that sort of connection with the countries they were named after. There's also much yet to be discovered about why the second battle cruiser squadron, why, it's so unique, why is it unique in the Royal Navy? There's nothing like it. Uh, why was it set up in the way it was, with the people it had? Where did they come from? How was it regarded in the wider fleet? And how did it reflect on the relationship between the United Kingdom and the Dominions? Furthermore, as uh, James has noted earlier, noted earlier the social side of the Navy becomes far more intriguing the more you look at it. These four gentlemen all commanded the second battlecruiser squadron during the war years. And for part of that time, they were dual hatted as a commander of the Australian fleet. What we don't know is very much about them. What connections they had, why were they chosen, what influence did it have on Australia? All those sort of issues which need to be examined. Um, I'll leave it there for questions, but in summary, I can safely say there's extensive work to be done and um, I look forward to seeing you guys do it. <laughs>